little Mrs. Doubtfire for you today on the Loudwire Podcast. My name is Joe, and Graham, not here. He's still on vacation. He's playing with animals on an animal rehabilitation reserve in Africa, and today he actually uploaded him hanging out with a cheetah. So he's doing cool things over there, but I'm holding down the fort back here in the studio, still doing lots of fun things like today. We've got Michael Wilton and Eddie Jackson of Queensryche on the podcast. Queensryche, one of my all-time favorite bands. Stoked to have these guys in here. Never met them before, interviewed anything like that. Uh, actually, I think I did meet Michael Wilton once after a show. Like, real quick, brief conversation. He probably doesn't need to remember. No need to remember, really. Anyway, we talk about some fun stuff on here, like the Grammys. And one really weird thing that we noticed, if you hear the paper rustling, looking at the nominees now, that there's best metal performance. There's Baroness, Gojira, Korn, Megadeth, Periphery. All right, pretty solid. Pretty solid. Good job. But under the best rock song, there's David Bowie, highly sp- suspect, Radiohead, 21 Pilots, and, yes, Metallica. Not in for metal performance, but in for rock song. So very peculiar, and it lends itself to the conversation of what defines rock and what defines metal. We tried to figure it out when Monkey from Korn was on the podcast. We kind of did, but still not really. It's an abstract thing here, guys. So anyway, that's something that both Michael and Eddie noticed. And they just kind of talked about their overall reaction and their thoughts on the Grammys, the whole process, and how it relates to rock and metal, or (laughs) more how it doesn't relate to rock and metal. So we talked about stuff. Queensryche, Todd Latore, new singer, if you're not familiar, if you haven't kept up with the band the last couple years, it was a lot of fun. So everybody, get ready to sit down and shout! Let it out! Sit down and shout! So we've got Michael Wilton and Eddie Jackson from Queens right here. Thank you guys so much for sitting down with us today. Hey, thanks for having yeah, us. Thank you for having sitting us. Sitting down with us. I'm used to having a co-host sitting down with me. The Grammy nominees were announced. And I know Grammy is always a little bit of a controversial subject for... Uh, Let's have a look. For rock and metal. Yeah, especially these days, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so you guys are looking through the, the nominees now, but I'm sure one thing that's going to stick out to you is Metallica is not in the metal category even though metal's in the band name, and they're under the rock category. So, a little is weird. Is that a misprint? That is not a misprint. I hope it typo? is. Oh, I hope yeah, we're going to get some alert emails saying, retract everything you've written, that we messed up, but I think that is exactly how it is. Wow. So, I mean, that's it's it's been like that for a few years, that uh, um, you, you, you question yourself, who are these people that are, are voting and making these decisions? Yeah, uh, Bill Kelleher from Mastodon is actually on the board now. So he oh. said his goal was to try to get them, have their ear a little bit closer to what's going on in the current metal scene, maybe recognizing some more extreme stuff. Oh, yeah. Which they did. I mean, there's stuff like Periphery on there for metal and Gojira. But then you got Metallica, the biggest metal band of all time, under rock. Like, what do you guys think of that? Well, well I guess my question is, is um, yeah, you've got your best metal performances, and you've got what five bands listed on there, and then you've got your best rock song. So, it, define rock. You know, I mean, is that part of the same sort of? Is it under the same umbrella as heavy metal, hard rock? It's a very weird line you know? of skirt. So, I yeah, guess that's because one you question. have uh, best metal performance. Yeah, which just but you don't include. have best best metal song. So. Yeah, so the metal performance includes, it could be album, it could be song. I mean, they've included, Judas Priest did a live album, I think this was like four years ago, and then they included uh, a song that was written in the 70s, but they nominated like a live version of it. It's really weird. Yeah, because under the best rock song, I mean, you've got David Bowie, Highly, Sus- Highly Suspect, Metallica, Radiohead, 21 Pilots. Just Metallica in that category... This don't fit. No. So that's why I was questioning, you know, define best rock song, Mm -hmm. you know, so. And then you've got Baroness in there. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Baroness. So they started off with like a little bit of a Mastodon type sound, a little sludgy, and they've drifted from that. And they're really a rock band now that's just got a really pummeling bass tone. 
So it seems like if you flip those two, like everything might be okay. Mm. You know, I'm a a member and I I vote. So oh, do I, you? I make sure I you know, I vote the, I th- what I think is the correct way. <laughs> you know, as far as metal and rock and and you know, all all the categories. So, but like I said, you know, it's a, it's almost it's one has to think is is this a mockery? Is this a joke? Is it like, is it, you know, do people even care? You know, is it, is it, metal, they don't really, is it, you know, yeah. it's all about the, the pop and the country and the rap and, and all that, you know, and it's, uh, Let them I don't have even, it. I don't think they even give this any airtime anymore. So yeah. it's like, is this, there's a sense of apathy, you yeah. know, that you just mm-hmm. don't even, you know, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I'm looking at best rock album. Yeah, you got Blink 182, Cage the Elephant, Gojira, Panic at the Disco, Weezer, and then yeah. Gojira is re- a really heavy band. And yeah, then they put them in there, and then they got nominated for metal. So it's yeah, uh, uh, just yeah. Hmm. So everything just kind of seems upside down. So let's talk a little bit about Queensrÿche now. You guys have been rebuilding the brand for the last couple of years with Todd Latore up front, and the band has always had very much of like a family feel like we were talking um, earlier when we were in the studio about the anybody listening forum and it just the passion the fans have for this band. So what does it mean to you to see this kind of like family mentality that a lot of other bands don't get that kind of treatment for? Wow. I'm really not, you know, I know Queensryche is, is, uh, you know, we've been around, uh, you know, a few decades and, uh, we're a band that tours a lot and subsequently, you know, we have a lot of fans that follow the band and, and I guess over the years they've met other fans and, you know, relationships are spawned and, and, uh, um, you know, these little online communities start happening and it's, uh, for us, it's great. You know, it's like kind of a mini grateful dead type of thing that's happening. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you got you got all these people that have just been following us for so long. And, uh, what's, what's interesting with, the um, the Queensryche as of now is that we're getting new and younger fans and, and, uh, people that, uh, really appreciate, you know, the last two albums and great albums that, uh, you know, obviously, hopefully they're going to go check out, you know, the first, the back catalog. Yeah. The Absolutely. first six mm-hmm. albums, you know, and, um, but you know, they only know us for the last two. So that just shows you how long we've been around, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> or how little they've been around. Yeah. No, you guys are from Seattle. And another thing about Seattle, if anybody listening is a football fan with the Seahawks and the 12th man. So do you attribute this to maybe just kind of like a Seattle thing, this whole family mentality? It seems to just kind of permeate there. I, I don't know. It's just something that... I guess we do up there in the Pacific Northwest is, you know, have that sort of family mentality, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we're all, you know, very passionate with our sports teams up there, you know, and our music as well. I mean, there's a lot of bands that have, you know, have come out of the Pacific Northwest, you know, um, got a statue of Jimi Hendrix. Yep. And, uh, I don't know. It's just, like I said, it's a strong passion for sports and music and everybody embraces that. And for some reason, it all just kind of pools together right there. Yeah. Now, um, what's going on with another album? We've got Condition Human, which has been out for a little while now. Love that album. It's a real grower. At first, the hooks kind of get you, and then you go in, you hear different things, um, especially Hourglass for me. But is there any writing that's going on right now for the next one? Seems like you guys are always in a little bit of a writing state. We, we constantly write. Uh, you know, that's you know, it's what we do. And um, you know, right now, we're right in the middle of a uh, four-week uh, tour, and which we'll finish off uh, sometime mid December, and then uh, take the holidays, you know, take a break there, and then um, uh, you know we're hoping to get in the studio sometime in spring, and um, you know, and then start all over again, you know, mm-hmm. um, get get the uh, the songs written, recorded, released, and uh, get back out on the road again, you know, always on the road. Yeah. And then you did that, uh, the run with Scorpions. So mm-hmm. do you feel that run was really a good chance to reintroduce the band to maybe some of the fans that haven't paid attention to Queensryche in the last decades? Yeah, since most kind of like definitely. Late 90s I mean, it's, it's a lot of exposure. Yeah, you get the, a tremendous amount of exposure with 
uh, um, you know, and it's it's a good mix of music, you know, having Scorpions and Queensryche together. It's a lot of melody. And, we're fans uh, of that band too. Growing yeah. up, you know, uh, the the fans that their fans, you know, recognize us, and it's like it's kind of reminder, hey, we're back, you mm-hmm. know, that kind of a thing. As well as uh, you know, performing at some of these festivals, you know, it's like uh, we played uh, festivals like Welcome to Rockville, where it's kind of a younger audience, where we're playing with. Uh, um, you know, bands that are a little younger than us. And it's, it's great for us because they're, we're exposing them to our music as well as, uh, you know, so for us, we just try and keep it balanced. You know, Mm -hmm. we, we do a fair amount of, uh, festivals. We do a fair amount of, uh, uh, ground tours and we do a fair amount of, uh, fly dates. We'd even do, uh, uh, rock cruises. (laughs) So, so it's just keeping yourself out in the public eye, you know, Mm -hmm. that's kind of our goal. Now, do you have any fans that have come up to you and said, I had no idea you even had a new singer and they're immediately won over? Because usually that's a very tough position to put a fan into is they're there at the concert to see a band and all of a sudden they go, wait, what do you mean he's not in here anymore? We get that every once in a while. You know, I mean, for those fans that haven't been in touch for a while, you know, they don't really know what's going on with the band. Um, But yeah, I mean, we've, you know, there's times where we've, we you know, fans come up and say hey uh even to this day they're even hey when did chris DeGarmo leave the band you know it's like <laughs> wait a second you know i mean that's been a while you know and then to to find out that you know we have a new singer you know you're going to run into those type of fans that like i said that have been out of touch but you know uh it's interesting like in the you know we've run into fans that uh were in the back of the audience right and so they can't they, even really see they, the stage. You know, they just, they dug the show. They love the songs and, you know, they go, wow, did he grow hair? That's <laughs> great. You know, it's like, they it didn't even know. short and long and it kept going you know, back So and some forth, people so are reasonable. just, you know, they're just there to hear the songs, mm-hmm. you know, and they're completely unaware of all the, you know, every Chaos. all the goings on yeah. that's, that's going on. So, so for us, it's, it's, you know, we're, that's why we're performing so much you know we're proving ourselves and um you know you run into that a lot the skeptics Mm -hmm. and uh and it's you know you you prove them prove them wrong every time like what axel rose had to do over the summer everybody doubted them and he's like not only am i going to sing with guns and roses and it's going to be the best show you've ever seen i'm going to go and join acdc too and just killed it yeah so always good to see guys proving people wrong Now, let's get into rocker versus writer here. Uh, today's topic is going to be the best replacement metal singer. So our stipulation here is that the band's first singer has to have had recorded something that was released. So I know there's Al Atkins and Judas Priest, and then Halford came along, but there weren't the recordings. And then, of course, we're going to exclude Todd here, because I don't think anybody in this room wants to argue that Todd is not one of the best replacement singers. Wouldn't be too much fun there. So, do you guys have wow. have anybody in mind here? Re, re, that's currently in the band? Uh, nope, could have been at any time. Just somebody who replaced an existing singer in a band. I think, um, like, does, does Alice in Chains fit your category? Yeah, definitely. I, I think, you know... They, we had William on the podcast, actually, yeah, too. Yeah, I think, you know, they're, they're friends of ours, Mike and Jerry. And, yeah, and, Seattle. And... Uh, um, we, we fully support them, and I think they're doing a great job. Oh, it's incredible. You know, they're, yeah, they're kicking huge amounts of ass. Mm-hmm. New twist on an old classic. Right. Mm-hmm. And, Eddie, how about you? Uh, I can't really think of one right now. Um, I'm just trying to dig deep here. Uh, so we got, like, Michael Kiske and, Hall- and Halloween. Oh, yeah, James yeah. James Labrie. Yeah. Um, Bruce okay. Dickinson. Right. Um I'll, I'll go with those. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what does that leave for me? That's not fair. Yeah, right. <laughs> Is there any one of those in particular that you like more than the other? Um, I, no, I can't say I like any more than the other. Um, I just think because, they, they're, they're, you know, there's a certain sort of common thread, you know, when it comes to the sound and mm. uh, the vocals, but there's also... You know, there's a little little bit of their own style, 
mm-hmm. you know, um, that kind of sets them sets them apart, you know. But um, there's still that they, you know, th- these singers still keep that integrity sound, that vocal, you know, uh, sound, and uh, which really benefits the band, you know. And mm-hmm. I mean, it's difficult to try to find a replacement singer, um, especially if your singer is known to be this to have this particular style um but uh yeah i think i think it's great that uh you know bands are are able to you know find a replacement for whatever reason you mm-hmm. know but uh yeah i mean we're we're one of those bands too that uh, have experienced that situation yeah i mean my pick would be bruce dickinson anybody who's listening to this podcast knows that i'm the biggest iron maiden fan on the planet um but i mean when you look at paul diano now um, I mean, the performance just isn't as strong. And if you try to think of Iron Maiden, if they continued with Paul Diano through the years, and it's, I don't think people would be talking about Iron Maiden in the same light that they do today. Well, I mean, I, I, I love I, the Diano albums. Yes, and but. so do I. I mean, like, but like I was saying before, um, though, two different singers, but they still brought the integrity and the the, the vocal delivery that Iron Maiden was known for when when Paul was in the band, mm-hmm. you know, um, to find somebody like Bruce. I mean, it's I think it's it's awesome. You know, I think it's pretty impressive to uh, to find a singer that can really come in and you know I guess somewhat reinvent the band, but still keep that sound that they're known. Yeah, for. but not changing too much, right? Because you listen to a song like gangland or uh or children of the damned stuff like that those all sound like songs that could totally fit paul's voice yeah and then again new twist on an old classic kind of thing Mm -hmm. Um, i mean as a fan growing up listening to iron maiden i mean those earlier albums with paul diano were awesome and still are still awesome you know and then here's bruce dickinson you know uh starting from the number of the beast on i mean it just the trajectory of that band just, just kind of kept going up. it kept going up, you know, and uh, so you know, I, it's great, you know. I actually met a guy on the train when I was going to an Iron Maiden show, and he said I still refer to Bruce as the new guy because he'd been a fan from way back mm. in the day. I just thought that was like the coolest thing. <laughs> but um, let's return to the Alice in Chains thing because that was really interesting because William Duvall brought a totally different vocal style to that band too. But again, keeping everything within the realm of the band sound. Obviously, you know, Jerry's doing the backing vocals and he harmonized with Lane, so you still have that quality there. But um, what else about William do you like that he brings to Alice in Chains? He's just got a passion, you know, and he's he's representing the band. Um, he's also know, a in, musician. In a, you know? in, a, in a classy, classy way. Very much so. Um, and, you know, like I said, it's, it's the songwriting and what they're doing right now, and it's... It's really well done, and it's, um, you know, we go way back, and it's great to see them doing what they're doing. Yeah, that William and, and, and Jerry really complement each other. Yeah, know? That's a very tough vocal spot to, to fill, just because Lane's voice was so distinct. Right. And a lot of people thought that it was heresy, and he even talked about it when he was on the podcast, that he got so much backlash when he joined, but he's like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to shut your mouth for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So... That does it for Rocker versus Writer. Uh, we got a little bit of a, an abbreviated version this time. So let's go back to uh, some more stuff with Queensryche. Um, one thing that I find really interesting with Todd up front is that he is 15 years younger than Jeff. Do you feel like you just extended the potential lifespan of this band by like maybe 10 years or so? Because I, f- I feel like these singers aren't going to be able to, the metal singers at least, these powerhouse singers aren't going to be able to do all this stuff like, you know, into the late 60s. Not everybody's Ronnie James Dio. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, do the math. It's a matter of physics. Mm -hmm. You know, it's obviously, uh, you know, Todd takes care of his voice and and he's, you know, he knows how to sing. Yeah, he doesn't drink, do anything. He has the right right, right technique and, uh, um, yeah, he has definitely a long future ahead of mm-hmm. him if he takes care of his voice which he's doing so yeah it's um i mean and when he started singing you know in the band he was what 40 30 yeah, 39, something 40 like that, something yeah. so it was like yeah right around at there. that age you know 
do the math and yeah, compare. Yeah, Rob Halford was 40 on painkiller, so yeah. <laughs> there's proof enough. Well, listen, I mean, you know, uh, Jeff did a good job conditioning his voice as well, you know, mm-hmm. in the earlier days. I mean, uh, but, you know, he took care of his voice, you know, but the one thing is, you know, it's, it's, you, you get to a certain age, you know, um, your voice is going to change. Mm-hmm. And it's only natural, and there's no, you know there's no right or wrong. It's All just you can the fact exactly, you know. And uh, but it's you know bringing LT into the band. I mean, he sort of uh, you know kept once again that integrity of the vocal style that Queen Strike's known for, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know it, it's it's been a lot of fun working with him. Yeah, and like you said about Jeff, like being on top of everything. If you watch that footage from um, any. Please go on YouTube, watch footage from the Rage for Order tour and the footage in France specifically. If you watch that, there's no way you could come away from watching that and going, and you can't say that's not the best metal singer that there's ever been. Like, that is the most dominant vocal performance I've ever seen anybody deliver on stage. So, what was it like just having that kind of utility to work with back in the day where this guy could just do like literally anything with his voice? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's. Everybody had their strengths in the band, and mm-hmm. that's what made the band unique, and that's what, you know, fired the passion and the emotion in, into Queensryche. So just, you know, having uh, that ability, you know, puts you kind of at an advantage, uh, you know. And, and believe me, I mean, it's back in those days, he was forging a, a whole movement, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and... Uh, just that style, you know, the operatic power uh, metal. I mean, he pretty much nailed it. <laughs> yeah, he definitely laid the foundation, <laughs> built the house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're talking about um, kind of like developing a new style. Rage for Order, as everyone knows, or if you didn't know, um, really kind of ushered in a new sound for progressive metal. It was still kind of in the early, in its infancy there. But I feel like now is kind of the best time ever for Prague. Everybody seems so open-minded these days. Would you agree? I have no idea what it, what anybody's into these days. It's so crazy. <laughs> um, it's just, you know, the World Wide Web is where everybody tries to get all their info. And it's... Um, yeah, it just feels like a lot know, more people with, are open-minded interesting, to music. Interestingly enough, uh, Condition Human came out, and uh, when I was over in Germany doing a lot of press, I actually, uh, for the first time in, I don't know, 15, 20 years, I started doing uh, interviews with Prague magazines. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like, uh, just because of, you know, <clears throat> I go, what, I'm asking them, what constitute us being progressive? You hmm. know, it's like, and they said it's uh, you're not you're you're not the traditional pop song format in your A-B, songwriting A-B. style. Yeah. yeah, he goes, you you guys have different time signatures, and uh, I go, yeah, but we've always done that. You I know, mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're, you know, <laughs> listen, we're we're what heavy metal, hard rock, part of that genre, you know. Mm-hmm. But we do also have elements of progressive rock in our in our uh, compositions, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe that's you know, even though um, it's not. Uh, you know, quite the progressive band like other bands that are out there. Um, like Dream Theater, right? It's like it's like math meets sports almost. It's so yeah, it's just math have, rock, but they're, but they're it's amazing band. You know, they're awesome. We you have know? elements of a lot of different styles, mm-hmm. and that's what you know makes us Queensrÿche. So it's not just prog. It's not just metal. It's not just pop. It's not just you know. It's an amalgamation of everything right. that makes something uniquely. <clears throat> Put it all right. in a blender, press liquefy, and, and there you go. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and exactly. Well, that being said, I mean, I'm curious, you know, if there was, you know, if we were nominated for some Grammy award, um, where would Queensryche... Uh, alternative, why al- not? Would it be alternative? <laughs> would it be under rock? Would it be under metal? I don't know. <laughs> Which is or, a good thing to have, too. Right. Not being able to really pigeonhole what exactly yeah. your sound is. So uh, last uh, bit here, uh, what's lined up for 2017? Anything specifically? Well, just like I was uh, saying earlier. Um, just going to work on the writing. Yeah, we're writing now. Um, finish there. up the tour mid-December. We're writing as you know as we tour, um, constantly always writing. Um, and then uh, 
you know, uh, start. Uh, we've got a couple of shows lined up, you know, in January and February, but um, we're certainly trying to um, start, re- you know, g- get the, the offers are coming in. Yeah. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's the but it's not come uh, as far as full on, you know, ground tours. I think we we need a rest from that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like I'd say, we're going to focus on the writing. And, you know, our goal is to hopefully get it out in the fall. And I know there'll be some touring in the fall. So awesome. But, but, you know, it all depends on the tunes, you know, getting the <laughs> songs written. Yeah. 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 Like I said, I mean, uh, uh, 2007, spring of 2017 is our goal to, that is the, 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 you know, the time frame when we want to go in and start recording the new album. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you guys so much for sitting down with us on the podcast. I keep saying us because I'm not used to Graham not being here, but Michael Wilton, Eddie Jackson of Queensryche. Anything else you guys want to add here? Um... Shameless plugs, uh, queensrikeofficial.com. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, thanks thanks to all the Queensrike fans for the support yeah. and Loudwire for having us on. Awesome. Thanks, guys. All righty then. We had Mrs. Doubtfire at the beginning, and now we got Ace Ventura. I don't know what's going on today. Maybe too much coffee. Maybe not enough coffee. Maybe not enough sleep. Maybe a combination of all of it. Maybe none. Anyway, I'm rambling, and I'll stop so that way you can listen to what else we have to say here. So that was a lot of fun. I mean, they are two guys from, as I said, one of my favorite bands, and they couldn't be easier going. I'm sure, as you could tell listening, like they're a lot of fun to sit down with. And it was a lot of fun talking about the Grammys. Like I said, again, what's rock? What's metal? Does anybody know? The Grammys know? We don't know. Well, we kind of know. We have an idea. It's something that we internalize and we know it when we hear it, but we can't really do anything to exactly express what is strictly rock, hard rock, metal, what's going on. Even when Michael was talking about Prague at the end, he's like, I have no idea what Prague even means today. So... It's pretty interesting conversation. Labels get slapped around all the time, especially by us writers. We have to be able to relay what something sounds like to you guys who are reading everything. And thanks for reading. But when we put the label on it, it's not that we just have this obsessive compulsive need to pigeonhole every little thing. It's just that, again, when you need to explain it to somebody, you need to tell them what it sounds like. And the best way to do that is to get in all these little nuances. And I don't know. It's... It's a good problem to have when you have all this diversity happening in the metal spectrum. And then one thing that was a lot of fun really was talking about them rebuilding the brand and seeing fans who maybe haven't seen them in a while didn't know that Jeff Tate is no longer in the band and their reaction to it, that they are supportive, that anybody who has heard the last two Queensryche albums or have seen Queensryche with Todd LaTorre know that that dude is a damn powerhouse behind the mic. He could belt it out better than anybody maybe not better than anybody but as good as the best guys except maybe that jeff tate france rage for order footage seriously look at it it's un it's unbelievable i almost said unridiculous i couldn't even figure out a word and the rocker versus writer i thought it was funny that eddie couldn't settle on uh <laughs> on his favorite and he's right there are so many good guys to choose from but he made the most important point was that our favorite replacement singers haven't altered the sound of the band of course yes bruce dickinson sounds radically different than paul diana but when you listen to it it still has that certain edge again that indelible quality that we can't really define kind of like rock and metal and then of course michael wilton nailed it with william and alice in chains people were super skeptical about him joining the band how could you replace lane this is insane how could you do that and they did it and it's awesome people love it anyway i'm gonna get out of the studio And by the next time you hear another podcast, Graham will probably be back. And then maybe you could hear all about his crazy adventure with all these ridiculous wild animals, and rhinos, cheetahs, and monkeys, and all that awesome stuff. Maybe he won't. Maybe he'll keep it to himself. I'm about to get out of here, but that doesn't mean that you need to stop at the Loudwire Insanity. Head to Loudwire.com for all of your rock and metal news. We've got lists going up all the time. Follow us on YouTube. If you aren't already, why aren't you? We've got so much amazing content going off there. And then leave us a nice comment on this podcast. Tell us how much you liked it. Tell us how much you miss Graham. And then tell us who else you want to see on the podcast. We always have good people coming in, but we want to know who you want to hear from. 
And then don't forget to follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, follow us on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter at Ice Nerve Shatter. Ice Nerve Shatter. It's God Flesh Song off the first EP, in case you never listened to this podcast before. And if you have listened to this podcast before, hopefully you've checked out the song by now. I've been saying it for quite a while. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget. Don't ever forget to play some Dugan. <laughs> <laughs>